Welcome to all our panelists and delegates who are attending this important session on uh, management of crystallizing Crohn's disease, a common problem confronted by physicians as well as surgeons. Uh, we have an elite uh, panelist to discuss this particular topic. We have Professor Eli Ogotu, who is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine, University of Nairobi, Kenya. Then we have Dr. Devendra Desai. He is a senior consultant gastroenterologist at the uh, Hindija Hospital. And we have Dr. Madhunil, who is Professor of Gastroenterology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kenya. Dr. Vishal Sharma, uh, Associate Professor of Gastroenterology at the prestigious PGI MNR Chandigarh. Dr. Sanjeev Patil, who is Associate Director of Colorectal Surgery at the AIG Hospitals. And Dr. we have Dr. Um, we have Dr. Varghese Thomas, who is a senior consultant gastroenterologist at Malabar Medical College, Koriko, and Dr. Smitha Devani, who is uh, from the University of Nairobi at uh, Nairobi. And she had a fellowship training in the United Kingdom. So I request the uh, our first speaker, Prof. Eli Ogutu, to take over and make his presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just uh, see if I can. While he is getting uh, uh, ready with the okay. screen share. Yeah, that's where I am. Can someone help you with the slide sharing? I don't know why it is not. It's not coming with me. Can you share screen, Professor Ogutu? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, it's coming. Now? Yes. It's coming. Okay. Put it on. So screen show. Is it there? Yeah, it's See? perfect. Yeah. Have it now. You can please okay. start. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Gutu. Uh, thanks for the organizers of this uh, uh, magnific magnificent uh, training uh, forum. 
on uh, IBD and uh, I must thank Dr. Rupa and the team for inviting me to be part of the uh, faculty today. I was asked to talk about a patient presenting with a perianal is it, is it IBD? Uh, what's a perianal It's an abnormal whole tract or cavity that is lined with granulated tissue and connects a primary opening inside the anal canal to a open in the skin. There can be multiple secondary tracts extending from the same primary opening inside the anal canal with the separate external openings in the perianal skin. Majority of cases arise as a result of preprograndular infection with the resultant abscess formation. The abscess represents the acute inflammatory event, whereas the, uh, whereas the fistula is a representation of the chronic process. When the abscess ruptures or is drained, an epithelialized tract can form that connects the abscess in the anus or rectum with the perianal, perirectal skin. Is it comp the issue was, is it complex? Is it simple, complex, or IBD? So some the one is the, the site of uh, primary opening. Is it low versus high? Determine the site or high. The people rectal is muscle If the region is below the pure rectal is then considered below fistula. If it's above, then high. And most of the high fistulas, all the high fistulas tend to be complex. There are some of the low fistulas. That's the anatomical, uh, the, uh, the grammatical anatomical representation of uh, anal, anal anatomy. As you can see, the internal uh, perianal, the anorectal ring comes where the internal sphincter and the external sphincter and uh, people rectal is meet. And uh, so that's who, the site which you could consider to be the uh, cutoff for high and low. I'll skip that one. Now, the second thing to consider be beyond the level of origin is how much of the anal sphincter is transected by the tract. Low fist, uh, in low fistulas, the tract passes through few or no, no sphincteric muscle and is relatively close to the skin. You see this one in simple fistulas low intersphincteric fistulas and low transphincteric fistulas. These are considered to be simple. In high fistulas, the tract passes through or above the li a large amount of muscle. The root may be complicated and further away from the skin. Examples are high intersphincteric fistulas, high transphincteric fistulas, supraphincteric fistulas, and extrasphincteric fistulas. This uh, category will fall under the complex uh, fistulas and IBD also comes into this category in most cases. That's uh, sort of uh, anatomy of the anal canal with those tracks I've been mentioning. If you, uh, the, this will be a superficial or uh, subcutaneous fistula, the one I'm pointing at. Then the one between the external, the external and internal uh, uh, sphincter would be uh, uh, intersphincteric fistula. Then the one crossing the external fistula uh, would be transphincteric fistula. Then you have the ones which go high up and uh, the supraspinteric fistula and then the extraspinteric fistula. Is it simple? As we have mentioned, if it is simple, the site of our primary origin tends to be low. Uh, and the track would be superficial, as I've mentioned, and could be low uh, intersphincteric fistula in origin, and could be low transphincteric also. There will be usually there will be a single track. If the tracks are multiple, then it is not simple. The track tends to involve less than 30% of the external sphincter, and uh, usually the presentation there is minimal pain or no pain, and usually there is hardly any fluctuation to suggest perianal abscess. 
and there will be no rectovaginal fistula or anorectal stenosis. In complex fistula, the origin tends to be high, involving more than 30% of external sphincter. The fistula may be multiple, may have multiple tracts and external orifices, but with a primary site of origin. Uh, it could be recurrent, and there may be quite a lot of pain and fluctuation suggesting an abscess. Those associated with other predisposing factors, e.g. Crohn's, radiation, TB, carcinoma, also tend to fall under complex fistulas. Again, that's the uh, sort of pictorial PAX classification where you have already shown you uh, the submucosal, intersphincteric, transphincteric, suprasphincteric, and extrasphincteric uh, fistulas. That's almost uh, the same thing. Is it IBD? Consider it. Consider IBD if the fistula is complex. If it is high, anal fistula, you also consider IBD. Also consider IBD uh, if the following conditions may be present. That means you have to do uh, an examination of the patient and check for evidence of anal skin tracts, fissures, fissures, deep ulcers lined by exuberant granulation tissue, strictures, or stroke stenosis. Patients with IBD generally would complain of pain, pruritus, rectal bleeding, spontaneous pus, drainage and discharge, may have constipation, diarrhea, incontinence and weight loss. They tend to be young and uh, if you do a colonoscopy, you may find some areas uh, suggesting presence of colitis, though at times uh, there may be none. And look for complications of intestinal disease. If they are there, then you may have to think of IBD. What's the take-home message from what you have just said? First, you, when you are confronted with a patient with a fistula, take a good history. Do a good physical exam, both general and localized exam around the anal area. Do also a digi digital rectal exam, checking for uh, strictures, uh, fluctuations, and tenderness. Also do a pelvic MRI to delineate the tracts. If indicated, do colonoscopy, and at times, if we still don't uh, uh, achieve our aim with a pelvic MRI, we may have to do examination under anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Okoto. I think this was a very simple and elegant, uh, elegant presentation. I think the message that we take home from this presentation is that all these patients, if you have to answer the questions, we need to have a good digital rectal examination as well as a pelvic MRI. Am I right? Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We quickly move on to the second question. Um, and the second question is, how do we outline a simple approach to a complex fistula? Should it be surgeon first? Should it be physician first? And I'm sure this is going to be a matter of a little bit of debate. So over to Dr. Vishal Sharma for your presentation. Good evening. At the very outset, I must thank uh, the IBDNC for asking me to speak on outlining a simple approach to a complex periandal fistula. Uh, we know that there are multiple classification systems which are available for uh, perianal fistula. And what we want to talk about today is the complex perianal fistula. Now, there may be various types of complex fistula. There may be a trans sphincteric fistula, which is high, that is above the dentate line. The internal opening is above the dentate line. Or it may be an extra sphincteric fistula or a supra sphincteric fistula. So, uh, this depends upon whether uh, it is excluding the external sphincter or the entire sphincter, uh, including the internal and the external sphincter. Now, if there are multiple internal openings or the fistula is cross crossing the midline or there are associated perianal abscesses or a communication with adjacent structures, the fistula becomes a complex fistula. Now, why are these fistulas difficult to treat? Uh, as you know that they have low closure rates and even when 
they close, they may have a high recurrence rate. That is because of a high pressure area at one of the openings. The fact that the fistula is a, has a cylindrical topography with a poorly regulated inflammation and there may be uh, microorganisms which are present inside the fistula which may uh, result in non-healing. Further, there may be epithelization of certain tracts and then the entire fistula may not become uh, closed. So what are the goals of therapy in these patients? The goals of therapy include control of infection, drainage and eventual closure of the fistula. And while interventions are done to this, ensure that the sphincter function is preserved so that there is an improvement in the quality of life and eventually that there is a non-recurrence of these fistulas. So coming to evaluation, the first part of course is the clinical evaluation. Apart from assessment of underlying IBD, we need to see the perianal lesions, whether there are any ulcers, what is the site of the opening of uh, fistula externally, whether there is any discharge or what kind of discharge is there on gentle pressure and whether there is any tenderness which may suggest an abscess. The next step is to delineate uh, the anatomy of the fistula and usually an MRI is of help for this particular purpose. Uh, the endoanal ultrasound is also equally good and certain patients may be uh, requiring examination under anesthesia. So a large majority of these fistulas can be delineated uh, with any of these investigations and if we use two then virtually all of these can be uh, delineated. The next step is management and treatment and we know that if there are any fistulas uh, the associated abscesses with the fistulas, these need drainage and the use of antibiotics to control the pelvic sepsis. Now, cetone drainage is required in most, if not all, of the patients with perianal fistula. This is because we want to avoid a fistulotomy, which may result in sphincter dysfunction uh, because of the high uh, involvement. Now, the material used for cetone drainage are very, very variable including sutures, vascular slings, rubber bands. But what we want here, usually in Crohn's disease uh, related complex fistula, is a draining kind of loose cetone rather than a cutting cetone. Now when do we remove these cetones? So some of the, this is, this is a matter of uh, personal choice for the patients and many of the patients may be okay with a permanent indwelling kind of cetone which may be replaced off and on and uh, there is epithelization and chronic drainage. But most of the patients would want a closure of the fistula and therefore uh, the optimal timing is probably uh, within a short period of starting NTTNFs. Now coming to the medical therapy, as far as the guidelines go, the therapy with the immunomodulators or antibiotics alone is not recommended by the guidelines, but that may be an option in resource limited setting. Infliximab is a therapy of choice and it has clearly been shown to uh, induce and maintain fistula remission in perianal Crohn's disease in, in randomized trials. Now at least for initial therapy the dose of 5 mg versus 10 mg is similar. At any map there is indirect data and this may be an agent to use in patients who do not or have lost response to infliximab. There is some data, uh, indirect data for cetolizumab. How do we optimize anti-GNF? Let's say if a person is not responding and then the definition of non-response also is not very, very clear. But uh, if an individual is not responding clinically or on imaging, then we may want to increase the response to anti-GNFs. And this is by use of concomitant antibiotics or maintaining a higher trough levels in some of these patients by using uh, add-on immunomodulators. Now, let's say that... Uh, there is a lack of healing in presence of active uh, IBD, then this may be a case to change the biologics and in fact there is some emerging data although not direct data which suggests that vedolizumab may be useful in patients with CD related perianal fistula. In fact, the enterprise trial showed a healing in almost 50% of the patients and in a recent meta-analysis the pool response was around 35%. Similarly for map. The clinical response in uh, systematic review of 25 studies 
is 44% at 6 months and around 54% at 12 months. Again, in patients with active CD, the other uh, options for treatment of perianal fistulas is filgotinib, which uh, of course is not yet available in India, but there is data presented in a recent uh, ECO conference. There is data for use of tetralimus, and then there is uh, uh, observational data for hyperbaric oxygen. In fact, in this meta-analysis system done by us, you can see that the pooled total, total fistula healing was almost reported in 50% of the patients uh, with hyperbaric oxygen. Now, the other option, of course, is the surgical procedures, uh, apart from, of course, CETON, but these procedures are done when you have healing of the underlying IBD and you are trying only to treat the fistulas. So if we look at the surgical procedures, then the first of course are the disconnection procedures where you try to disconnect the fistula. So here you can see that there is an internal opening and with the advancement flap using the rectal mucosa, this has been closed. So this is done in, of course, inactive disease. The pool success is around 60% with an incontinence rate of 8% and this is one of the suggested therapies. The other new procedure, of course, is ligation of the intersphinctric uh, fistula tract. So you can see this is the intersphinctric area and here the fistula has been ligated. And this of course is done only in the setting of inactive abdominal disease with a pool success of 53% uh, in uh, metanalysis and a lower incontinence rate as compared to advancement plan. But the ECO guidelines do not recommend this because of the uh, paucity of enough data. Then. The other procedure could be filling the fistula tract and closing that tract. One of the options, of course, is fibrin glue, where an injection is done from the external opening and the glue is seen coming through the internal opening, resulting in a mechanical sealing. Now, this is known to increase the fistula closure after seton removal and recommended as one of the potential therapies. Now, plugging the anal fistula uh, while the seton is removed has been compared in a randomized trial with C-tone removal alone and has similar closure rates and is not recommended as a therapy in Crohn's disease, disease related chronic uh, complex anal fistula. The next of course is uh, ablative therapies where either laser or cautery could be used to ablate the tract but there, is only, there are only a few case studies uh, to report in Crohn's disease. The, Next surgical option, of course, is the fecal diversion, uh, which can be used in non-healing fistulas or even in presence of active IBD. And this results in almost a 64% clinical response. And when a restoration is attempted, actually there may be a recurrence of the disease. Now, some of the patients uh, would eventually need a proctectomy and a permanent diversion. And although many of us would think of this as a failure of therapy for some of the patients it may be a uh, life changing surgery and the quality of life may actually improve of course this is not the end of the story and some of the patients will suffer because of poor wound healing and collections in the dead space now the other question of course is surgery versus medical therapy and this was a randomized trial the PISA trial which included 44 patients with perianal Crohn's disease with high fistula and a single opening all of whom received antibiotic ceton drainage and they were randomized to a chronic ceton drainage for one year anti-TNF for one year with ceton removed and then anti-TNF induction followed by a surgical closure and you look that reintervention whether it was surgical or anti-TNF, you can see that the recurrence rates were very high for chronic ceton drainage. But in the same cohort, there were patients who were not willing to be randomized because they had a preference for certain therapy. And here you can see the re-intervention re rates were similar across the therapy, meaning thereby that the patient preferences play an important role in eventually deciding what is the appropriate therapy for that particular patient. Now, there is an emerging role for stem cells and both uh, bone marrow or adipose tissue stem, mesenchymal stem cells have uh, proved to be useful in this particular uh, condition. But of course, uh, this is a costly therapy uh, and the exact place is not yet very, very clear. 
So for Crohn's disease and perianal fistula, you first treat the associated complications like abscess. Most of these patients will need antibiotics, drain it with cetone and you start them on anti-TNFs. There are certain situations which are as yet unclear about cetone drainage, especially the time of removal. Now, once there is a response, you try to attempt closure with medical therapy. And if there is a response, the cetone is removed and you follow these patients up. Now, if there is no improvement or the fistula persists, but there is active IBD, you can switch over to other biologics or medical therapies. If, however, there is no active IBD, but the fistula remains open, there are surgical procedures, especially the disconnection procedures, which may be attempted. There is an emerging rule for stem cell therapy, uh, and this could possibly be above the surgical procedures uh, in the eventual algorithm. And finally, if patients do not respond, there may be a need for a fecal diversion. So there are two questions which I was supposed to answer. What is a simple approach to complex fistula? Well, as Einstein said, and I don't have anything to add, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And whether it is the surgeon or the physician first, well, I'll just quote Helen Keller here, that alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. I think very, very strong messages. I think uh, if, we, if we actually translate into management of IBD and complex fistula, it just means that you can make it simple by controlling the infection as well as the inflammation. And then, of course, getting the physician and the surgeons together on the same platform to manage. I think what you mentioned about CETON is very, very important. And I always felt that we have probably underutilized this particular very simple old age uh, uh, solution to uh, a common problem. And to throw more light on that, uh, we have Dr. Sanjeev Patil, and he's going to tell us on more on the good old CETON placement. And uh, would you go in for a draining one or a cutting one? Over to you, Sanjeev. Dr. Sanjeev, you are muted. You are mute. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. My screen is seen, sir? No, we can't. We can see your screen, but uh, not the projection. Take up some discussion while really yeah. uh, uh, while uh, Sanjeev is um, getting his uh, screen right. Uh, just like to ask uh, Vishal about uh, you know the the use of uh, the newer biology tools in uh, officializing drones like Vido and mistaken map. Uh, how is the data panning out now? Where do you think it will settle down? Would it come ahead of infliximab or would you still think that you have to first try infliximab and then end up with a failure of infliximab and then go to veto or Yeah, I think, sir, that is a very important and relevant question uh, as of today. 
uh, but if we look at uh, the data closely, and uh, I particularly like to talk about the enterprise trial here. Uh, it's a very, very, I, I would say, irrational choice of a trial design where uh, uh, just a 10 week uh, additional dose you know, was compared. Uh, and very interestingly, if you look at, uh, if you read between the lines, they talked about failure to conventional therapy also. I mean, only I think 70% uh, were actually yes. who had previously received anti TNF. So, right now, I, I wouldn't. For vedolizumab, I won't say that it is ready for prime time uh, use before NTTNFs. Same is for ustekinumab. We actually don't have any direct trial data for ustekinumab. Uh, so at least for these two biologics, I, I would rather not put them before NTTNFs. They, they may be a place, you know, as uh, that, that we can try in patients who have not responded to NTTNFs or have lost response to NTTNFs. Another, uh, sorry. Uh, another uh, Common, uh, commonly available, very much used uh, molecule is tacrolimus. Now, we've been hearing about that, and I noted that you mentioned a, a official up closing rate of 43%, which is quite good. But why do you think that, uh, what is the reason why we have not used tacrolimus? It's yeah. not popular. No, all that I think, yeah, even in our. Uh, Sanj uh, Sanjeev, uh, what to do is you get your screen uh, thing ready. We'll yes, go over the next talk yes, 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 uh, and then uh, let us know when uh, you're ready because in the interest of time. I wish I wrote to you. You, you. you can continue. I'm sorry to have interrupted. Yeah, so uh, tacrolimus, interestingly, is a drug right. which uh, has also been found to be useful in ulcerative colitis. And uh, also, the uh, that was actually a RCT, randomized trial. I think way back in 2003, where this uh, excellent, uh, I would say, response rate was demonstrated. But again, let us also understand that uh, the study did not actually have imaging at that time to look at the response rates. So we don't really know how it will pan out. But certainly, it is a drug which we should use, especially in a resource limited setting, you know, where many of our patients cannot use NTTNFs. Mm -hmm. I think this will be one of the talks today. Uh, we'll come. We'll come back to. We'll come back to that uh, in, uh, in, during the panel discussion. Um, uh, we'll go straight to the next. I think Devendra Desai. Um, uh, if you could just get ready with your presentation, because this is where I think the action starts. Um, uh, small bowel fistulizing disease. We are moving away from perianal. Perianal. We'll come back to when we talk of CTON, But small bowel fistulizing. Uh, disease is actually an ibidologist's uh, nightmare sometimes, you know, um, because of the simple reason that the results don't seem to be as good as the other, uh, the usual Crohn's disease. So I request Dr. Devin Desai to tell us how to get the best results in the management, from the management of small bowel fistulas. Can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, for this today's opportunity. Before I start, I would like to congratulate all the members of ENC for our first publication. And this would not have been possible without tremendous efforts by Dr. Rupa Banerjee and Partha Pal. Uh, my, my today's talk is small bowel fistulizing disease, how to get the best result. And I wish to thank IBD ENC for this opportunity. So, how common are the fistulizing Crohn's disease? In a worldwide uh, study, this was between 10 to 12, 50 percent of the patient. And according to the Indian Society of Gastroenterology Task Force, which was published in 2012, the prevalence was 4.4 percent. In our study from Hinduja Hospital, we found that the fistula occurred in about 3.9 percent at baseline at 11% at 5 years and in 21% at 10 years, which you can see here. Uh, but important thing is to know that the fistula will recur in one third of the patients. Now, let us look at the location of fistula. As uh, Professor Vishal Sharma mentioned, the perianal fistulae occurred in 54% of the patient followed by enteroenteric fistula in about a fourth of the patient, followed by rectovaginal fistula, 
and other fistula comprising of enterocutaneous enterovesical <coughs> and entero abdominal fistula in other uh, group of patients uh, these fistulae are located in the area of active luminal disease in about 3/4 of the patient and they are located at the post operative site after surgical resection from the normal small bowel in about 1/4 of the patients and this should be considered as surgical complication unrelated to crohn's disease now these fistula majority of them present uh, with fistula after a median of 3 years of luminal symptoms and in remaining 1/5 they presented at the disease onset that means fistula and the disease presented simultaneously now the small bowel fistula can have significant mor morbidity in the forms of septic complication metabolic and electrolyte abnormality extensive skin damage and psychological disturbance the mortality tends to be disproportionately high at 6 to 33% due to sepsis high fistula output age and comorbidity and malnutrition with low albumin <coughs> you can see that this patient has undergone uh, previous surgery there are multiple draining fistula uh, which are draining pus and this result in significant morbidity now let us quickly understand pathogenesis of small bowel fistula uh, you will, we know that there is epithelial barrier defect in this inflammatory bowel disease through the defect there is invasion of pathogen associated molecular pathway then we have two pathway one is healing pathway and the continuing pathway in the healing pathway the epithelial cells uh, the transition to mesenchymal cell with the production of myofibroblasts with the attempt to heal in the uh, this category or this cascade we know that the inflammation induced molecules we have invasiveness you can have several molecules like tnf tga beta il13 and mmps but the most invasive property is with beta 6 integrin which continues the invasiveness with the development of fistulae <clears throat> now let us go to the diagnosis the diagnosis of fistula can be obtained by ct scan mri and ultrasound and both have sensitivity of about 70 all of them have sensitivity in about seven, about 75% and specificity of more than 90% and this is a reference which is used as surgery and endoscopy or barium study the diagnosis of abscess can be achieved by ct scan mri or ultrasound and the sensitivity is about 85% and the specificity is about 90% what is important is that in clean patients with no clinical suspicion of fistula cross sectional imaging change the management in 3/4 of the patients now the management of fistula consists of two principles control infection induce mucosal and fistula tract healing the multidisciplinary approach is critical Uh, a percutaneous drainage of intraabdominal abscess with antibiotic treatment can avoid surgery in about 30% of the patient it's important to maintain the nutrition and in combination with that medical or surgical therapy is essential so what is medical therapy it consists of antibiotic thiopurines tacrolimus tnf alpha inhibitors vedolizumab and ustekinumab antibiotic thiopurines and tacrolimus have no significant response or remission tnf alpha inhibitors the response is to the tune of 44% as compared to 28% in the placebo with a odd ratio of 1.45 for the induction the response rate is 34% with the placebo response rate of 16% with a odds ratio of 2.01% for the maintenance anti tnf have similar odds ratio the and when we compare the combination of antibiotic and tnf alpha inhibitors versus tnf alpha inhibitors the combination is better for the response and remission uh, vedolizumab have 31% fistula closure rate but the numbers are small and they are taken from the gemini 2 study the recent enterprise study that professor vishal sharma mentioned showed good result for perianal fistula but we don't know about the uh, intraabdominal or small bowel fistula ustekinumab has 51% fistula closure 
but again the numbers are small and there is definitely some use for maintenance after closure of fistula and again as professor sharma mentioned the recent literature on perianal disease there is a lot of literature on that filgotinib as uh, professor sharma mentioned has been studied and found to be useful for perianal fistula we don't have any data on the other small molecules on intra on small bowel fistula uh, i would like to present this recent study which was combination from uh, aims and uh, hinduja uh, 53 patients with non perianal fistula were included uh, enteroenteric fistula accounted for more than one third followed by mix followed by enterocutaneous vaginal and vesical fistula when 32 patients received medical therapy of which 10 patient received immunomodulator of which four had partial response 22 patient received biologics and there was 41% complete response and 54% partial response three patients required surgery due to primary or secondary non response to biologic 21% received surgical therapy and the response rate was 86% repeat surgery was required in three patients and the biologics were required in nine patients after uh, surgery i would like to present two example to demonstrate the complexity of small bowel fistula this is the first patient who is a 60 year old lady known crohn's disease uh, located in small bowel she developed enterocutaneous fistula after surgery for intestinal obstruction she received infliximab without any response and changed to adalimumab again no response fistula drainage persisted you can see that this is the <coughs> fistula with discharge and surrounding uh, excoriation of the surrounding skin she underwent surgery and uh, surgery showed uh, stricture distal to fistula there was complete healing of mucosa which was due to biologic and the stricture and fistula segment were resected the wound healed well and she is well for more than 5 years now the second patient is a 64 year old gentleman who presented with bleeding pr in 2004 the colonoscopy showed pan colitis and terminal ileal ulcers uh, for the refractory disease he underwent pro total proctocolectomy with ileostomy and ipa in 2006 he needed re exploration a week later and they found leak at ileostomy site which was closed between 2008 and 2016 he had recurrent pouchitis later towards 2016 there was recurrent intestinal obstruction requir requiring multiple admissions treated conservatively at that time ct scan showed long segment distal ileal thickening in 2016 he underwent exploratory laparotomy for intra abdominal abscess plus enterocutaneous fistula <coughs> in january 2017 he developed three hypofood fistulas and a perianal uh, fistula which needed surgery uh, this is not a very good photograph but it clearly demonstrate this three fistulas opening he had a very high c reactive protein ranging from 70 to 384 and a low albumin he received infliximab from 2017 to 2019 in the dose of 10 mg per kg reduction there was reduction in fistula drainage by more than 90% but the recurrent episode of intestinal obstruction uh, occurred initially surgeons were not ready to intervene because of the previous surgeries a ct scan in 2019 showed fistula were communicating to a small bowel loop proximal to uh, pouch and he underwent permanent ileostomy he is well now with a weight gain from 48 to 65 kg he is on treatment but not on biology so the question which was given to me how do we get the best result for a small bowel fistulizing disease in a patient who has crohn's disease a cross sectional imaging should be done to look for penetrating or stricturing disease percutaneous drainage of abscess with antibiotic can avoid surgery in 30% a special attention should be paid to maintain the nutrition a combination of anti tnf with antibiotic is better than only anti tnf surgery and medical therapy should go hand in hand and in a per persistent fistula rule out distal obstruction so thank you very much you are muted hello 
audible? Am I audible? Yes, now you are audible. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, Dr. David Desai. As usual, very crisp and clear concepts. Uh, uh, lots more to be discussed during the panel discussion. Uh, we go on to the next talk. Uh, the next is is uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Ready yes, sir. There is some problem with this broadcast, sir, but I can just speak uh, without the oh, slides. Yeah. Sir. Okay, we'll do that during that. Uh, okay, uh, fine. Uh, Sanjeev, the yes, question sir. that was given to you was uh, the good old seat on placement for uh, uh, the fistula, which I personally feel is something that is underutilized by the gastroenterologists of today. Yes, uh, you're totally right, sir. Yeah. So, there are two types, and I'm, I'm, I'm told draining or cutting, when is it that we use, what are the advantages of each, and what would be the ideal way to employ or use the seat on placement for healing of fish? Yes, sir. So, uh, very good evening to one and all. First of all, uh, I apologize for this problem in the broadcast. So, the topic given to me today is uh, a good old sit on placement, cutting or draining. So, it's a specific question. So, the cornerstone or the Achilles seal of surgical treatment for any fistulizing perianal Crohn's disease is a sit on. That's what we believe as surgeons. So, the most important thing is before deciding on any management in these patients with uh, fistulizing perianal Crohn's disease, it is a very complex disease. So, you have to be very clear on exactly two things when it comes to surgical point of view. One is the disease activity in the intestine, that is the perirectal inflammation that we call because of the active disease that is there. That is one important aspect. The other important aspect is the complexity of the fistula. These are the two important things that we have to be very clear before any intervention. So, the first thing to see for the activity of the disease in the intestine, the most important thing is a good history taking, a good physical examination with a digital rectal examination and the colonoscopy is a mandatory thing that has to be done before any surgical intervention. So, all this put together will be clearly sure about the activity of the disease in the colon, more importantly in the rectum. And next comes the complexity of the fistula. So, as already previous speakers have already mentioned, MRI is the best investigation. A good transanal ultrasound and examination and, and anesthesia is also a very good modality to see for the complexity of the fistula. So, as the previous speakers already have demonstrated the classification of parts, uh, it is very clear that the first two, that is the superficial fistula and the intersphincter, that is the fistula that runs between the external and the internal sphincter, are classified as simple fistulas and beyond that, that is the transpentric, extraspentric and the supraspentric fistulas are considered to be complex fistulas. So, once we are very clear, clear about these two aspects, then comes the surgical aspect. So, you can broadly classify these patients into three categories. One is the simple fistulas with no perirectal inflammation or no active prongs. So, in these patients, you can do a fistulotomy or a fistulectomy. That is, you can excise the whole fistula or lay open the fistula and leave it to heal. So, this is with obviously with the medical management. So, these fistulas tend to heal well with this type of treatment. Coming to the next category that is complex fistulas where there is no perirectal inflammation. That is, there is no active Crohn's disease, but it is a complex fistula. In these subset of patients, we tend to be a little radical and then try to do different procedures like the advancement flap or the ligation of the interspintric tract that was already demonstrated by Dr. Vishal. Uh, so, these two are important modalities and if it is a rectovaginal fistula, then we do a lot of complex surgeries like uh, the gracilis flap is put in between the repair, uh, such things, but we have to be very clear that even though doing all this, the rate of healing and the rate of complications, that is the rate of complications is a bit higher when compared to a non prongs patient. That is, the incontinence rates are pretty high compared to where there is no Crohn's, even where there is no active rectal disease. That has to be explained to the patient. 
And the third set, the subset of patient is uh, whether it is a simple or a complex fistula and the patient has active prongs, that is there is perirectal inflammation. In these patients, better not to meddle around, don't do any radical procedure. The only thing that the surgeon can offer is a draining sit-on. Again, as my topic was, it was whether a cutting or a draining, a cutting sit-on, I believe is a contraindication in a patient with Crohn's disease. The basic principle of a cutting sit-on is a wire is passed around the fistula tract and the tissue in between, that is the fistula, uh, the sphincters are, uh, the sit-on is tightened so that there is strangulation of the tissue which causes ischemic necrosis. So that leads to cutting of the sphincter slowly and every two weeks we try to tighten the sit-on so that it keeps on cutting and the proximal end keeps on healing. So this is the basic principle of a cutting sit-on. But here the problem is the sphincter damage is very high and because these patients with Crohn's they have a pro-inflammatory state and the healing is very poor, so the incontinence, incontinence rates are also very high. That is the reason cutting sit-on is not indicated and the basic idea of a cutting sit-on is to cure the fistula. In the sense, once the sit-on comes out, the whole fistula is is completely healed and it is cured as opposed to a draining sit-on where we put a wire across just loosely tie it the principle here is to drain the fistula tract so that there is no infection or pus accumulated which leads to abscess formation which is a contraindication again for even medical management like uh, biologics so here the intention is not to cure the fistula but to just drain the sit uh, fistula it acts as a stent here so that the pus doesn't collect inside. So that is the basic difference between a cutting and a draining sit-on. So all these patients with Crohn's, draining sit-on is indicated, not the cutting sit-on. And again, one important uh, problem here is because these patients are on long-term sit-on, so the sit-on as Dr. Vishal was telling, there are multiple uh, things used like a proline suture material and all, they are all very hard and those knots keep pricking the patient which is the major morbidity there so usually the best option is to use a vascular loop which is very soft and the patient will not even be aware that there is a sit-on so that material is to be used which i would like to highlight and the last thing is uh, looking at the guidelines and consensus statement of the eco 2020 uh, coming to the surgical management of fistulizing perianal tons disease whether medical management is superior, surgical or a combination of both. As of date, there are no prospective trials which have shown which is superior, but observational studies have clearly shown that a combination of both medical and surgical management is very important. And early surgical consultation is a must and it is very important for a better outcome for the patient. And coming for the fistulotomy and fistulectomy, simple uh, fistulas where there is no perirectal inflammation, these are indications and they are good results. Coming to the lift and advancement flaps, complex fistulas with no perirectal inflammation or active disease, this is an indication. And as uh, already uh, told, anal fistula plugs and fibrin glue are not a good uh, modality because the success rate is not much, in, especially in patients with Crohn's. And a rare complication, a rectovaginal fistula obviously can be treated as I told by gracilis flap repair but the complication rates and the success rate is significantly lower even though there is no active bronze disease and finally diversion stoma is the last resort where all the modalities have failed both medical and surgical and it is a uh, chronic pe uh, perianal sepsis the patient uh, ends up in a quarantine only then diverting stoma but one important thing is about 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent of the patients remain. The soma reversal may not be possible. That has to be explained to the patient uh, because even after diversion, patient may not completely improve the perianal disease so that we can revert the stoma. So that has to be clearly explained. And obviously, proctectomy is the last uh, goal of management where you have to remove the whole rectum so that the patient's quality of life improves uh, because they don't respond to any other management. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Sanjeev. Well, it is said that uh, a successful man is the one who 
is there at the right time at the right place right yes i think uh, uh, similarly a successful gastroenterologist or an ipidologist is one who uses the right biological biologic at the right time so how is it that we decide on the right biologic at the right time it is over to dr madunil niriela for his observations over to you dr madunil Thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me. If you yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. okay. So, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation, Rupa and the organizers. My topic is the right biology at the right time. How do we decide? I have no relevant conflicts of uh, interest to declare. So, in the next twelve minutes, I'll I'll answer four questions: Who should receive biology therapy for Crohn's disease? When is the right time for biologic therapy for Crohn's disease? Which biologics can be used for moderate to severe Crohn's? And how to choose which biologic to use for a given patient with Crohn's disease? So let's see who should receive biologics for Crohn's disease. Treatment strategies in Crohn's are driven by patient risk of complicated disease. What we mean by complicated disease is high risk for rapid progression, and this. we know there are clear risk factors uh, being young at the initial uh, diagnosis less than 30 years extensive anatomical involvement or multi segmented disease the presence of perianal disease or the presence of severe rectal disease deep pulses on endoscopy prior surgical resection or stricturing or penetrating behavior of the disease which includes the fistulizing cone this disease we are concentrating today so if the patient has any of these factors we should consider them as high risk for rapid progression and these are the patients that will need biologic therapy and treatment should be stratified based on the crohn's severity risk and this aga clinical pathway for deciding the initial treatment of crohn's disease is very useful uh, to categorize these patient or stratify these patient into low risk or moderate to high risk and the moderate to high risk patients i will emphasize again they are young at diagnosis less than 30 years they have extensive anatomical involvement they have presence of perianal disease or severe rectal disease they have deep pulses on endoscopy they might have surgical resections previously and they have stricturing or penetrating disease so these patients need anti tnf monotherapy or anti tnf plus the thiopurine where thiopurines are not tolerated they can be given methotrexate or they can have a non anti tnf biologics like bedulizumab and ustekinumab so when is the right time for this biologic therapy in crohn's disease so we know in the natural history of crohn's disease firstly there is subclinical information because of the relapsing and remitting nature of the disease there will be ongoing uh, inflammatory activity which will result in cumulative digestive damage so there is a window of opportunity in the early phase of the disease where we can intervene and prevent the digestive damage so if we at the time of diagnosis if we monitor the patients and employ treatment for tight control we will be able to limit the digestive damage that occurs cumulatively in the late phase of the disease but unfortunately biologics are started very late when there is already stricture formation fistula abscesses and even post operative uh, so what we should dr nirella just i think your slides are not moving can you just make it full screen yeah it's full screen uh it's actually stuck uh is it moving now uh not really uh could you unshare uh, stop the sharing yeah. and start can yeah. we i'll do that i'll do that can you see the slides now you can see the slides but it's not full screen and it's not moving yeah 
Oh, I think uh, the bottom on the bottom left there is a right arrow that will have to not the up and down button. I think technical glitches make every program successful. So <laughs> I okay. Think only I that think uh, it brings in okay. a lot of excitement too. Uh, is it moving now? No. I know you have to go down and make it full screen. Yeah, I have actually made it full screen on, on my screen. On the left side, at, at the bottom on the left side, there is right left button. Probably that is the one. Up and down won't actually. A simple method will be to touch on the screens on the left yeah. side. Yeah, is like it moving now? Three. Is it moving now? No, no, no. What is Not yet. Is it moving? No, no. Screen. Can you click on the uh, panel on the left side? Click on the screen, sometimes that starts moving. Then click on the screen. Uh, you share the desktop view first. Un unshare, then share the desktop view. Try to get a full screen. Can you see? Uh, this is okay. Yeah, we can Does see. It, does it move? It's not moving. Yeah, now it's moving. It's moving your, now. Your cursor we can see. Are the slides moving? The slides are not moving. Are the slides moving now? If you go to the bottom of the screen, there is the full yeah. screen. Uh, there is a full screen option. Option. Yeah, I have done that actually. In in, in my in my uh, view, it's full screen. Can you see the slides? You can see the slides. Is it moving? Uh, I think um. Vishwesh from our technical team will just help you. Thanks. I'll stop sharing. Is it possible for you to send it across by mail to uh, Rupa, I think, uh, so that we can then go on with uh, the next talk and then by which time uh, they can load it from that side? Yeah, thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we'll come back to you, uh, uh, Dr. Nirela. Uh, well, this, the next talk should have come uh, after uh, Dr. Nirela's talk, but the biggest challenge uh, to management of a difficult Crohn's disease uh, is to get a patient who is financially uh, strong or who's, for whom it is uh, affordable. Uh, unfortunately, many patients drop out because either they are not able to afford or the, the thought of having to take these injections for a long time is something that puts them off. How is it that we should manage an unaffordable patient? We have a, a very eminent gastroenterologist with huge experience at the medical college and Dr. Varghese Thomas is going to tell us what are the choices in an unaffordable patient. Good evening everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Dr. Ruba, for inviting me for this session. I wish I had uh, all the talks uh, earlier uh, so that uh, it would be just pick and choose for me. But anyway, I will uh, try to manage. OK. When you have patients uh, from the very low socioeconomic status uh, coming with uh, diseases which require a lot of money and management, sometimes that's, a, that's sometimes I feel uh, I should have been some other joke. Okay, 
The agenda of my talk will be what is the prevalence of CD in economically disadvantaged communities? What are the problems uh, faced regarding access to healthcare? What are the options uh, in healthcare for economically disadvantaged people? What are the problems faced by the healthcare workers in managing such patients? Do we have alternative strategies and other supportive measures? I have very little literature to actually depend upon. One is the article by uh, Ruma Raj Pandari in World Journal of Gastroenterology 2020 about uh, disease in low and low middle income countries. And another one by uh, Dr. Ruba and her uh, friends in Lancet Gastroenterology 2020 on optimizing management of uh, uh, Crohn's disease. And of course, uh, these are the recommendations from the Asia Pacific Consensus and also from uh, Asian Organization for Crohn's and Colitis and Asia Pacific Association Gastroenterology. So, IBD was a disease of the developing world. But for the last, in the last century, we have noticed that the third world is catching up as we, the industrialization and economic situation improve. In view of the sheer population size of developing world, the real burden is huge. Sometimes it is calculated that it may the real burden may be even more than that in the United States. Most patients are mobile sitting, but mostly middle class and high income groups are affected. And I haven't seen a, a, an IPD or CD in a real poor situation. We cater to tribal population who are extremely poor and extremely living in unhygienic situation. I am yet to see in a case of ulcerative colitis of CD in them, but I see a lot of uh, asthma, lung, tuberculosis, uh, CS, stomach, and other sort of diseases in those people. Probably the reverse way the hygiene hypothesis is working. <laughs> Countries in Southeast Asia, Middle East, and North Africa seem to be competing with the developed world because there's an increased uh, prevalence and incidence of Crohn's disease in these countries. Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, East Asia, and Pacific also catching up. Syria and Morocco, in fact, reported the highest incidence of Crohn's uh, disease recently. However, Bangladesh, Cameroon, Ghana, Malay, Uganda have uh, not much of cases. The Indian incidence of Crohn's uh, disease is 3.91 per 100,000 population. When we consider the country's uh, population as 150 crores, it amounts to around 80,000 uh, cases of Crohn's disease per year. You can imagine such a huge load. Sri Lanka it is 0.52 and prevalence is 1.2 to 2.3. We have only scanned literature from other countries. The study from Kerala on IPD actually showed that the prevalence of IPD is more in the uh, people with a high gross state domestic product. That means people with the better income have again higher prevalence. In, in districts with the better income, they have the high prevalence. Again, suggesting that this, uh, the disease tends to be more in a slightly economically better people. Now, what are the options available to these patients regarding healthcare? In, in India, we have both private sector healthcare and public sector healthcare. As I have to deal with an unaffordable patient, I will deal with the government healthcare, the PHC, CHC, Thailand Hospital, District Hospital, Government Medical College, Limited Specialty Hospital. In the state government, these facilities are generally available only in government medical college or in special hospital. In central government, no institutions like AIMS and you now new AIMS in, my, in uh, other, other states. PGI, SCPJ, Jibber, etc. In most of these central institutions, the management part, the investigations are free, but uh, the treatment part is not completely free. As I understand from AIMS, uh, the patients uh, are provided the medicines uh, from local purchase. The problems regarding healthcare and government sector is that healthcare is a predominantly state subject and there is very little allotment uh, budget uh, for uh, healthcare. There is overcrowding in the hospitals, more population, lack of personnel, lack of investigation, lack of treatment facilities uh, and the people who are attending these hospitals are uh, very economically weak and they are considered as UIPs, unimportant persons and not VAPs who can make opinion and then make changes. Okay, this national sample survey regarding three indicators of social consumption of health showed that ailments such as gastrointestinal and host of other illnesses uh, pose a substantial economic burden on a population and push them to below poverty line. So illness make a poor people poorer, a middle class even poor, and unless we have got universal health coverage. And there are various options of uh, health access to people, free treatment by government hospitals, both inpatient and outpatient. The central government has got Aishman, Bharat, Yochana, giving 5 lakhs uh, treatment per family per year, free treatment for various conditions including HIV, STD, TB, etc. Unfortunately, IBD is not included. Many patients will have to depend upon their health insurance, either private or government. 
So what are the problems for patients? The long and protracted illness with periodic exacerbation, facilities for diagnosis and treatment are not available in rural settings. Multiple visits to urban hospitals are required to make a diagnosis for follow-up, expensive investigation and high cost of IP admission. Many a time the doctor himself is not very sure of the diagnosis. Just like in the case now, even today I had a problem, a dilemma between to decide whether it is indeterminate uh, uh, colitis or heart disease or even tuberculosis. The need for prolonged medication, some medications, especially most important medications are very expensive and unaffordable. Surgical treatment may be required, again, most unaff mostly unaffordable if you're done from private setting and the need for treatment with the medication even after surgery. Regarding the approach to the patient, there's no difference. There's no difference uh, regarding the diagnostic approach, clinical and uh, investigative modality. And luckily, most of the investigating facilities like CT, MRI, etc. are available in most of the uh, teaching hospitals. Therefore, a diagnosis is not a big issue. The issue will be regarding the management aspect and uh, management with the broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, drainage of an abscess uh, and immunomodulators are not a big issue because this patient will be able to afford and hospital will be able to afford. And in the case of perianal fistula also, the approach will be the same. Uh, initially, rolled out abscess, then mostly initially treat with antibiotics, then biologicals are more of a mirage for poor patient unless there is financial assistance. And set on us, so earlier, would be another important choice for most of these patients in financially unaffordable situation. And we have to be in close liaison with surgery because dedicated surgeons are available in most of the teaching hospitals and we can, if you have a good liaison with them, we can actually plan the right type of surgery at the right time to save our patient. No various options are there. Monotherapy or immunoabilities have not much of a role. So whether the patient is poor or rich, I think that is not point in just continuing a monotherapy. If you continue to antibiotics like a ciprofloxacin or metanodosol, there is some advantage. Or continue antibiotic with azathioprine, there is some advantage. But overall, the advantage is only as long as the antibiotic is taken. Once the antibiotic is withdrawn, the fistula recurs. So that is the main problem. And of course, the side effects of long-term metronidazole, peripheral neuropathy, bad taste, uh, tendon rupture in the case of uh, uh, ciprofloxacin in the... Again, antibiotics have been generally found to be used now for a supplement for infliximab as well as for adalimumab. In fact, the response has been found to be better. What about biologicals? Biologicals are the gold standard for the treatment of perianal disease. There is no doubt about that. But most of the patients are not able to afford. As per one report from India, less than 1% of the patients, uh, are total number of patients are capable of affording uh, biological as per the standard regime and continue it on a long-term basis. So most of the patients will take initially and then discontinue after a few courses. There are problems of reactivation of infection like TB and HB, which is more, which is more prevalent in tropical countries or in underdeveloped countries and we have to be very careful in the initial introduction of this drug as well as subsequent evaluation. Most of the biosimilars are not available and another option will be to do an expedited introduction of biological rather than waiting indefinitely uh, to start. Perianal disease is a high risk disease therefore we have to get control of the disease as early as possible and we have to also do what is known as rapid de-escalation. This idea has been mooted by Dr. Ruba's, uh, uh, in Dr. Ruba's article along with her friends from China. A person with Crohn's disease on infliximab, it has been found out that if you reduce the dose after the initial phase, the person can be maintained in good condition. So even if the top levels are low, uh, the, we can reduce the cost of the medicine by 28% by reducing the dosage either by reducing the 5 mg per kilogram body weight or extending the, uh, the frequency of uh, infusion of infliximab. However, when the when, when such a de-escalation is done, there is a high risk for a perianal disease to recur and we don't have much studies to depend upon. What are the other options available for a poor patient? Continuation of medical treatment with methotrexate, tacrolimus, thalidomide, fecal microbial therapy, surgical measures and complementary medications. With the metrosectate, we have a very old study in 2003 from gastroenterology. Uh, 
37 patients were treated with the methotrexate pyrandrel, 25 had complete closure and 31 had partial closure. So the total result is 56% of the patients. The perianal CD on methotrexate showed complete or partial response to therapy. And the drug is not that very expensive. But all the methotrexate is ineffective. So the patient will have to go to some clinic or hospital to get this uh, injection. However, as the study is done so long back and we don't have any recent data, further studies will be required. What about typhrolimus? Typhrolimus has been found to be useful. 43% uh, of typhrolimus treated patient had fistula improvement compared to 8% of the class of treated patient. Uh, this is again old study in 2003 in gastroenterology. Meta-analysis showed that pooled remission rates were 44 4.34 luminal thrombosis and 28.46 for perianal disease. So at least in 30% of patients with Crohn's disease, perianal disease, trichrolimus can be given on a long-term basis. Regarding thalidomid, the meta-analysis to the IV has shown that 69% had a clinical response, 52% as in a clinical remission, both are different, response and remission. Overall, 72% of the 133 had sustained remission, 55% of 112 patients had sustained remission at 2 years. Root pool remission rate for thalidomide was 49% in luminal and 25% for Crohn's disease. However, almost 50% of the patients stopped treatment at 24 months because of severe toxicity, especially neurotoxicity. Newer versions of thalidomide has appeared. However, no studies are there on the management of Crohn's disease. FMT, we have a couple of studies and there are two meta-analyses which shows that FMT via the upper root is better. Preliminary studies suggest that FMT may be an effective therapy for Crohn's disease. And another meta-analysis also said that clinical, clinical remission with fresh stool FMT was higher than with caution. However, I would like to caution that these studies are not done on perianal disease per se. So, these results cannot be extrapolated. So, we require more data. Curcumin, again, there is a lot of interest of curcumin for management of Crohn's disease. There are a couple of studies, but there are no consistent benefits for curcumin when these drugs are stopped. So, we have to have more studies. So, I will tell you a case in your which I had to face 20 year old male with CD, ileocecal region, was an asatapin for 3 years, presented with perianal fistula, periodic drainage of pus for more than 3 months. Each time managed with ciproproxacin, antinate assault, which was given for 2 to 4 weeks, and patient used to improve, and then it stopped. Presented in October 2021 with pain in the left gluteal region, pain became severe over the next 2 weeks, pelvic MRI was done. After a lot of persuasion, large abscess collection in complex perianal fistula. Surgical drainage was done, prospective antibiotic surgery one. Drainage, however, continued. The need for biological were explained, but due to financial constraint, patient was not able to afford. Alternate option for diversion gastomy was suggested, patient opted for surgery. And though the patient had the Prime Minister's insurance policy, uh, the, the code for that was not there, for the, the particular surgery was not there. That's what was not possible to do the surgery free of cost in my hospital. So I had referred the patient to the government medical college and called up the surgeon and uh, requested him to do the needful. And uh, the surgeon was more than willing to help him out and drain and, uh, and uh, ileostomy was done and uh, he, he drainage from the open abscess cavity has stopped. No drainage from other fistulas opening. The question the patient is asking, can ileostomy reverse? That's a big question because when the ileostomy is reversed, it has been found out that 30 to 40 percent of the patient will continue to develop the perianal disease. Sometimes the ileostomy has to be made a permanent thing. But ileostomy uh, did uh, produce wonders in this patient. So, what is the ray of hope such people? Highly trained gastroenterologists and surgeons in all government colleges, super specialty department, and in central government institutions. So, diagnosis and management is not a big issue. The issue is that finances for the patient to get this drug. Reimbursement facilities for all government employees are there. Reimbursement for ESA covered persons are there. Local purchase of drugs for IBD patients by government hospitals, especially AIMS, I have noticed. I have heard that they are purchasing the drug locally and admitting the patient a daycare practice for a day, even give the drug and send them home and then call them back for the next injection. Then we can get discount scheme of virus from the pharma companies. Uh, even then, the treatment of adalimumab costing about 3.5 lakhs per year may come down only 1.5 lakhs. Still, that amount may be it's too much for the, our patient. Philanthropist person organization and crowdfunding may be possible in very rare situation. 
and of course if an rct is going on or some trial is going on and if the, if the person is my friend i will try to refer the patient to that center at least there's a 50 percent chance that patient will be in the active and of course we'll wait for the cheaper version biosimilars but what i hear is that even biosimilars are not that cheap so i want i i hope fervently that my slum dog will get a, hit a jackpot and then with that he'll be able to manage the chronic disease. The take-home message will be prevalence of CD is increasing in third world countries, low prevalence of CD in very poor people, but uh, not so for middle income and high income group. Refer to a government hospital where there is a team of dedicated doctors with necessary facilities for evaluation if the patient is not able to pay for even initial evaluation. Utilize all methods of non-surgical management. Try for biological with financial assistance. If, not, if no money is forthcoming, Surgical treatment may be offered from institution where there's a dedicated surgical team. And I have been very, very <coughs> uh, thankful to my surgical team. I am very thankful to my surgical team who have been more than willing to uh, help me out in such situation. They are, res they are resistant to do surgery for quantity routinely, but when there's a perianal disease, uh, they are willing to do drainage and to do certain, and uh, that's form of management. With these words, I conclude. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marges Thomas. Uh, uh, yeah, it is a philosophical talk, and uh, I think you brought in all these aspects. We will discuss that um, uh, later. Um, uh, Dr. Rupa, are we ready with uh, the pre Nirela's uh, presentation? Great. Okay. Uh, it's over to you, Atli. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Sorry about the technical. Yeah, in a way, it was a good change because we dealt with a challenging situation. Now we go on to a situation of a patient who is affordable. You can, uh, you, you have the liberty to decide which one you want to use. So the right biologic at the right time, over to you, uh, Dr. Madhuri Nirela. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so I'll quickly go through four questions. Uh, who should receive biologics? What is the right time? What are the biologics that we can use for moderate to severe disease? And which biologics to use in a given patient? So next slide. Next. So treating Crohn's disease is driven by risk stratifying patients. Uh, and we want to identify the patients who are likely to develop complicated disease. And this is uh, those with high risk of rapid progression. So I mentioned this, uh, less than 30 years at time of diagnosis, multi-segmental disease or extensive anatomical involvement, perianal disease, severe rectal disease, deep pulses on endoscopy, previous surgical resection and stricturing and penetrating behavior. Uh, and fistulating disease, uh, which we are talking about today. Next slide. So this AGA clinical care pathway for the initial treatment of Crohn's disease is very useful in stratifying patients to low risk and moderate to high risk. And the moderate to high risk patients uh, who have the risk factors that I have described already should either receive anti-TNF monotherapy, anti-TNF with thiopurine and not thiopurines alone, and methotrexate can be a substitute for patients who are not tolerating the uh, purine analogs, or they should receive the non-anti-TMF biologics like vedolizumab or stipinumab. Next slide. Yeah, so what is the right time for use of biologics? So we know in the natural history of Crohn's disease, there is initial subclinical inflammation. With the remitting relapsing nature of the disease, we know that there will be uh, continuous uh, and some intermittently uh, uh, bowel inflammation, which will in the long run result in cumulative digestive damage in the form of strictures, fistula, abscess formation and need for surgery. So there is this window of opportunity for us to intervene from the time of diagnosis before cumulative significant bowel damage occurs. So if we intervene at this stage, at the time of diagnosis, there will be less cumulative digestive damage and better outcomes for our patients. Next slide. So unfortunately, most of our patients will receive biologics 
when there is cumulative damage, already they are, they are presenting it fistulas when they already have sectors or even post operatively. But where we should aim, what we should aim is to start them on the biologics at the time of diagnosis, thereby improving the outcomes with the ability to achieve clinical and endoscopic remission, reduce cortic steroid dependence, reduce the need for surgery, and prevent long term complications. Next slide. So there is evolving definition of remission in Crohn's disease. We don't only go by the clinical remissions or the patient related patient, patient reported outcomes, no diarrhea, no pain. We also want biological remission with normalization of the CRP and the calprotectin. And we also need endoscopic remission in the form of healing of the uh, uh, mucosal healing or absence of ulcers on endoscopy. At present, histological remission is not needed. So what we need is clinical, biological, and endoscopic remission. That is what we should aim for. Next slide. Yeah, so we should treat to target and individualize these targets for our patients. After the initial treatment, we should assess the targets and adjust treatment accordingly and reassess the targets and continue monitoring and keep on adjusting the targets. And these targets can be the composite PRO, the patient reported outcomes plus the endoscopy changes, as well as the biomarkers, hemoglobin, uh, the extra intestinal manifestations, the abdominal imaging, and, and in, in children, growth and development. Next slide. So which biologic to use? So for moderate to severe disease, we know that steroids can be used for induction and thiopurines can be used for maintenance as steroid sparing, which steroids can be used for induction and maintenance. And for the past 20 years, we have these biologics which have revolutionized the treatment of Crohn's disease. First, we had anti-TNFs, the infliximab, alilumab, and surfacilumab. And then we had the anti-integrates, uh, vedulizumab, and then we had anti-P40, uh, the, the antibodies against IL-12 and IL-23 was taken in All can be used as induction or maintenance therapy. Next slide. So there are, these are some of the landmark studies uh, for the use of biologics, the evidence uh, for the biologics in Crohn's disease. So these trials go back 20 years. The first few ones were on infliximab, the ascent 1 and 2, the evidence for adalumab comes from classic 1 and 2 charm and also extend. And we have the, the landmark sonic trial which showed that infliximab plus azadapin is better than either alone, the combination therapy. We have evidence from Gemini for verilizumab and from Unity for the use of ustapinumab in Crohn's disease. And from 2018 onwards, we have uh, the biosimilars for the anti tns Next slide. So how to choose which biology? So uh, to capitalize on each of these agents' unique characteristics and to choose the best agent for the individual patients, I would concentrate on infliximab, adalimumab, vitalizumab, and ustekinumab because these have the most uh, uh, widest evidence. Next slide. Next, yeah. So in choosing the biologic, we have to consider patient factors and drug factors. The patient factors can be individual characteristics, the age of the patient, whether they are elderly or young patients, what are the comorbidities they have, heart disease and other factors and patient preferences. Also the disease characteristics may be the disease behavior, the complications, disease severity, the presence of extra intestinal manifestations, prior treatment success or failure. Regarding the drug, we need to look at the efficacy for induction, how rapid is the onset, what is the durability, uh, uh, is the use of therapeutic drug monitoring available or is it useful and positioning and sequencing of each of these drugs. And also it's very important to look at safety with regards to infection, cancer and specific concerns by the agent or the mechanisms. Next slide. So looking at each of these agents for uh, to use in high risk Crohn's disease patient, the anti have a rapid induction, that's very important. So they can be used in acute severe disease. There is significant maintenance benefit, but the problem is that immunogenicity and loss of response is quite common, about 30%. And this anti-TNFs are the only biologics proven efficacy for use in fistulizing Crohn's disease. Whereas verilizumab is a good option for induction 
and there is no need for immunomodulator combined combination. Usually, it is used for mild to moderate Crohn's disease. But we must remember that it has a slow onset of action relative to the anti DNAs, but it has an excellent safety profile with regards to use of elderly in the presence of infection and past history of cancers. Similarly, ustekunumab is an option for patients who have failed anti-DNFs. It is, in fact, the, the preferred second-line treatment. It also has a favorable safety profile in use in elderly. Uh, Thiopurine combination we can consider uh, in patients who are anti-DNF, uh, on anti-DNFs, uh, but we have to always uh, balance the risk and benefit of combining the uh, uh, anti-DNF with the thiopurine. Next slide. So this systematic review uh, demonstrates the first line induction for moderate to severe Crohn's disease. The effect size was positive for all treatments except for cetacilumab compared to the controls, but the strongest effect size was that of that for infliximab and adalimumab. So first line induction in moderate to severe Crohn's disease, we would prefer the anti -TNS. Next slide. So this is the second line treatment for Crohn's disease after infliximab, again the effect size was positive for adalimumab and ustekinumab, but not for bevelizumab compared with the control. So therefore, uh, for second line treatment after failure of infliximab, we sh should consider adalimumab or ustekinumab. Next slide. We should also look at the safety and the access. Uh, which influences positioning of these patients, especially in our region, uh, the availability and the cost. Uh, with regards to the safety, the steroids are the ones which have the least safety, uh, but the newer non-anti-TF uh, biologics, vedulizumab and ustekinumab, as shown in this diagram, has the highest safety compared to anti-TNFs, monotherapy or thiopurines uh, in combination. Next slide. So if you look at the individual agents, the anti-TNFs have a rapid onset effect. Uh, it has proven efficacy in fistulizing Crohn's disease. It is effective for a variety of extra-intestinal manifestations, mainly the joint disease. There is a relative abundance of safety data in pregnancy, so we can use it in pregnancy. Therapeutic drug monitoring is well accepted in anti-TNFs, where there is loss of response. And the availability of biomarkers make this uh, 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 relatively attractive uh, and uh, biologic uh, uh, type of biology. The downside is the infection risk. It requires careful screening for TB and hepatitis B, which is relevant in our uh, uh, countries. Uh, it is contraindicated for use in prior lymphoma, active cancer, congestive cardiac failure, and demyelinating disorders. And it can result in psoriasis foam and other uh, skin eruptions. And there is a need for combining with the thiopurines in the first year of use. Next slide. Next slide. So, Vedulizumab has an, uh, sorry, previous slide. So, Vedulizumab has an excellent safety profile. Uh, it is the choice for patients with high risk of infection, like elderly more than 60 years. It has low immunogenicity, therefore, there is no need to combine with the thiopurines. It can be considered for first line for mild to moderate Crohn's. Uh, it's a good choice for those with a history of malignancy and it does not impair the efficacy of vaccine. Including, we think that it does not uh, impair the efficacy of vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines. The downside is the slow onset of action compared to the anti-TNF. And we don't know the efficacy of, uh, for extra intestinal manifestations as well as fistulizing disease. Uh, uh, with VEDO compared to anti-TNF. It is available as IV formulations, not as subcutaneous. Therapeutic drug monitoring, the role is not very clear with VEDO. Next slide. Ustekinumab, again, excellent safety profile, good choice for patients with high risk of infection, low immunogenicity, do not need to uh, combine with thiopurines. It can be considered first line for moderate to severe Crohn's. Uh, it is, in fact, the second-line biologic of choice when infliximab fails. It can be given subcutaneously after IV loading, and it is a choice for patients with psoriasis and after developing psoriasis form reaction after infliximab. Downside, again, is that we don't know the role of therapeutic drug monitoring. 
it has limited data on uh, in treatment of uh, extra intestinal manifestation ex ex uh, except the uh, psoriatic arthritis. We don't know how effective it is very well in fistulating Crohn's disease. And there is limited safety data uh, with the use of live vaccines. Next slide. So, which biologic specific scenarios for first line therapy? If there is perianal or fistulating disease, anti TNFs are the best. If there is psoriasis, we tend to use ustekinumab. For older patients with higher risk of infection, it should be either VEDO or ustekinumab. When there is arthritis or synovitis, probably anti TNFs. Next slide. So reasons to switch, if there is anti-TNF induced lupide reaction, uh, uh, the choice should be a non-anti-TNF VEDO or Ustekunumab or VEDO. If there is anti-TNF induced psoriasis, Ustekunumab is preferred. Uh, and if there is a history of malignancy, solid uh, cancers, uh, probably biologics should be avoided during active chemo, but uh, subsequently VEDO or Ustekunumab is probably safe. Next slide. So in conclusion, biologic agents have revolutionized the treatment for Crohn's disease over the last 20 years. And biologics should be commenced at the time of diagnosis for the patients with moderate to high risk disease and not later on. So we must get it right at induction. Choosing a biologic agent is not algorithmic. It should be individualized. And the choice entails the availability, the cost, patient's age, patient's preference, the convenience of administration, each agent's safety profile, the, whole, the presence of comorbid conditions in the patients, and response to prior treatment and specific uh, reasons for using it uh, to treat something like fistulating disease and prominent extra intestinal manifestations. Next slide. So, Infliximab or adalimumab is favored in extensive small bowel disease when there is penetrating or uh, stricturing fistulating disease, perianal disease, high inflammatory burden, and when there is prominent extra intestinal manifestation, especially joint disease. So, ustekunumab is probably favored uh, in severe disease, moderate to severe disease, uh, in the setting of active or recent malignancy because of its safety profile when there is cutaneous. Uh, involvement like psoriasis and other complication. It is in fact the second line treatment after failure of infliximab and because of the safety, safety profile, uh, it is a choice for patient, elderly patients with comorbidities. And VEDO can be used to mild to moderate disease with low risk phenotype. It can be used in moderate disease when there is active infection or recent malignancy. Um, it can be used in post operative prophylaxis and because of its safety profile again, in older patients with comorbidities. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nirella. Um, I think you covered up virtually everything and uh, gives very little scope for discussion. But I would like to bring uh, request uh, Dr. Smitha to come in here. Uh, we've discussed a lot of issues as far as uh, fistulizing Crohn's disease is concerned. We've also discussed about what our approach should be in an unaffordable patient and with the challenges that we've been facing in this part of the world. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what are the challenges you face in your part of the uh, world as far as management of fistulizing Crohn's disease is concerned? Is it the same that has been outlined here? And of course, the affordability factor is something that I would like you to address. Thank you. Um, the good thing is that we do not actually see many fistulizing Crohn's, uh, at least not at, at um, the place where we wo I work. Actually, I've only had one patient who's been quite difficult uh, uh, because he did not want treatment. Um, I initially diagnosed him with, uh, I think at the age of 12 or 13, with uh, giant polyposis of Crohn's disease, which I'd never heard of, till I referred him to Simon Travis, uh, where he underwent a hemicolectomy and was diagnosed, because he actually presented with uh, um, obstructive symptoms. Um, and uh, subsequently, he emigrated to Australia, where he had developed uh, fistulizing Crohn's, anal Crohn's, he had surgery there. Uh, so he, and then he returned back to Kenya, but he did not want surgery, full stop. 
we, we had a difficult time with him because I said, all right, let's try antibiotic because there was a small abscess. Um, it reduced in size with antibiotics. Um, I said, fine, can you just see a surgeon, get an opinion? He refused. Um, I said, I do not want surgery. I do not want uh, any, um, uh, 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 any bags or anything on my tummy. It's absolutely no, no. So, and then again, uh, this month he has disappeared. Uh, I was planning to, you know, he said, if um, the surgeon can just remove that bit of pus, uh, he has got fistulas, which we need to do some work with, uh, maybe a sit-on, but he's disappeared again. So I'm hoping um, that he'll return and we have the problem. But our main problem is the UC and some of Crohn's, very little Crohn's, but it's there. So very little Crohn's is, is is not a challenge. It's a good thing uh, because good thing. Uh, <laughs> because you don't I, have that. I just wanted to pitch in a small thing. So this is very very typical of what we are seeing in the IBD ENC region. Dr. Ramesh will agree with me because what we are seeing is in every once there is industrialization, ulcerative colitis comes, and then two decades later, it's the Crohn's which is picking up. So, I mean, when we are studying, we are finding that, you know, countries like Bangladesh, Afghanistan, there is more of ulcerative colitis, uh, no, no Crohn's. In India, the northern part sees more ulcerative colitis. Crohn's we are seeing more in southern India. So, I think there is some enigma, but uh, uh, this is just the beginning for you in Kenya, I think, of Crohn's disease and fistulizing Crohn's. I'm sure. <laughs> I don't want it, but it is going to yes, come. Yes, that's another. Yeah, yeah. And then interesting thing is this year, uh, this year has been quite amazing. Uh, before I would make a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's every maybe one two months. Every now this year, I'm seeing one to two patients a week. Uh, today, I had a 17 year old. You see, new diagnosis. You know, and I'm just scratching my head. What's what's amiss here, or what's wrong? What has gone this year? Um, I can think of things, but I will not name them on the net. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. I think uh, we move on to the uh, the questions. In fact, uh, I'd probably start off with uh, Vargis. Uh, uh, a lower threshold for surgery is probably a solution for the non-affordable. Uh, patient. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, so when would you actually get the surgeon into the picture? Um, very, very early on or maybe after you have failed a course of steroids and as a therapy? Uh, regarding fistulizing Crohn's disease, we have to keep the surgeon in the loop in, in the beginning itself. Because uh, uh, except for a, a simple fistula, all complex fistulas, uh, uh, the natural history is that uh, medical treatment is not going to completely kill the problem unless we have biologicals. So in the absence of biologicals, giving antibiotics and immunomodulators will temporarily only sort of, we will buy in time only. In fact, uh, we will buy time, by that time actually 90% uh, uh, of the patients also may have chronic elsewhere. So that also become worse. So we are actually delaying the overall uh, recovery of the patient uh, by denying any form of uh, definitive treatment. But uh, if biologicals are not possible and, and if there is a need for surgery, we have to do for surgery. We don't have to jump and do surgery because a simple perianal abscess need only drainage. Uh, we don't have to do uh, we don't have to do any ileostomy ileostomy is a last ditch uh, sort of a, uh, resort uh, for diversion when we have no other options i think we have to give them all the options of other treatment including biologicals and that is why in my patient i gave them the option waited for some time they were not able to afford no money was forthcoming government was not able to uh, buy and give then they went for surgery Professor Ogutu, uh, I'd like to, uh, to have your opinion. Uh, you have a, we, suppose there's a patient with a perianal Crohn's, fistulizing Crohn's, has got a nice big abscess, you drain it. When is it that you would start this patient on uh, immunosuppressants and steroids as a part of the Crohn's treatment or, 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 or biologics? Uh, how long would you wait after the control of infection 
or would you start with the biologics or immunosuppression straight away? Professor Okutu, is got anyone else would uh, take it up? When would you? Uh, when what would be the right time to start? Vishal, you could answer. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very important concern that you don't want to hurry up into you know start starting anti TNFs in the setting of infection. So usually our approach is that we ask the surgeon uh, whether the infection is settled. And we do start it fairly early uh, once the surgeon gives a go ahead. So it's kind of a combined decision making, but at least I think uh, a week or so. But we don't delay it too much. I mean, once the surgeon gives a go ahead, I think that's the time to hit it. Okay. Any questions from the chat box, Dr. Jayanti or Dr. Rupa? Uh, can, I, uh, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. This, the, there are patients with Crohn's disease who have rectal disease. As well as, as well as fistulas, so what would be the strategy of management in such patients? Rectal involvement as part of the Crohn's disease and we have these peri-fistulas. So. Maybe Professor Nirala, you want to take this? So there yeah, I think rectal so. Disease, which normally happens actually, there's rectal, severe rectal disease and stricture and that leads to the fistula formation yeah. in fact. So, yeah, so the, the, the in Crohn's, usually, the, in typical Crohn's, the rectum is relatively spare. So, if you have severe rectal disease, which results in formation of these perianal fistulas, by definition, it's severe disease. So, the presence of rectal disease itself is a marker of severe disease, a high risk patient, and a, a patient who is likely to progress very rapidly. So we want to hit them hard and if, they, if, if the biologics are available, these patients should receive the biologics very early. Uh, and Dr. Along Vishal, there is a question, uh, I, um, there's a question from Dr. Vishwanath. He wants to know that uh, if a patient has severe rectal pain uh, and uh, despite treatment the pain persists, has it got anything to do with Crohn's disease? Or is there, I mean, how should it be handled? I just add on to that, that is, they have added on fissures, you know, that's a common problem. Very painful fissures with perineal fistula, so they do that type of situation. Okay, so basically, we are talking about severe rectal pain in the setting of Crohn's disease, right? Yes. So, so basically, it could be just the uh, fissure, which would be when patient is passing stool or it could be because of the severe rectal inflammation or it could be because of abscesses which are in the perianal region. So we have to actually as uh, Professor Sharma and Dr. Patil have mentioned we have to know what is the cause of the pain and treat accordingly. In case there is no abscess, in case there is no fistula there then we would treat symptomatically uh, in the form of topic, local or topical therapy. If there is anything like abscesses or fistula or so, we would like to treat the sepsis followed by the therapy for Crohn's disease. In case patient does not have any Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease, then we have to treat symptomatically with the local and topical measures in addition to uh, in addition to uh, simple measures uh, like uh, 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 sheets bath and the other things. Dr. Okay, well, Bhargis, um, yes. some of these patients, you know, we give them long-term ciprofloxacin and metronidazole. What is your take on that? I mean, 8 to 10 weeks and we find that most of them can yes, uh, second many down. patients, yeah. yeah. Uh, many of these patients can only afford ciprofloxacin or uh, tindazole or metronidazole and most of these um, uh, patients will be already on acetaiprine because they have the background from disease. So uh, acetaiprine plus ciprofloxacin and very often most of these patients are on cipro uh, tindazole combination. The study is that these drugs are useful for uh, the, uh, uh, controlling the fistulous drainage. As long as it is given, they give good results. Once it is stopped, the fistula regress, the, the drainage regress. 
So as long as it is given, the problem is that once you give it in an indefinite basis, for example, two or three or four months, uh, resistance will develop. And most of the fistulas are actually having skin organism, not endotheric organisms. This is skin organism, the high chance of uh, resistance to, you know, uh, resistant profile. So once we give it on an indefinite basis, we are likely, because we don't have much options. Ciproploxus in that group, a nitroamidazole group, some people give rifaximine also. Okay, but we cannot uh, sort of do it in, many people therefore do it intermittently. They give a uh, sort of therapy for uh, maybe two months or so, stop it and then wait for some day. It, it actually recurs, then restart. In fact, my patient, the young chap I told, he used to have it like that. Whenever he comes, he used to take antibiotics for a month, he'll stop it, he won't come, then comes back, uh, come when there is a recurrence again. So, as long as antibiotics are taken, fine enough, but we stop it, it will recur. That's the that's usual part. I think Professor Ogutu, are you available now? Yeah, I think uh, his bandwidth is poor, but yes. I think. Yes, 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 yes. Come back. Uh, so, uh, yes. do you use a lot of antibiotics or are you using biologics as well in Kenya? Well, the use of biologicals is quite low in Kenya. The cost is the issue. Our patients are poor and uh, insurance coverage is not that extensive. So antibiotic is what we use quite a lot and a few patients do use biologicals. But remember we see very few cases of Crohn's. I think uh, the, uh, we are going to have tofacitinib uh, made uh, available for Crohn's also because the initial phase 2B and other studies are showing encouraging results and I don't know how much it will work for fistulizing Crohn's disease but maybe it will be one low cost option uh, beyond uh, what we have and I think Sanjeev one last comment from you regarding the surgical um, management. Do you think that for simple fistula with a very, um, I mean there is a question on that actually, that there is very mild colonic Crohn's and a simple fistula. So it is a mild story overall. Do you think that you do, what would you do as a surgeon and then can we treat the colonic Crohn's separately without biologics? I just add one more question to Dr. Vishal, that is uh, in intro entry fistulas, what would be the line of management? You are muted. You are muted. Yeah, for the first uh, question, if it is a simple fistula, then the chance of sphincter involvement is rarely there. So usually we either do a sphincterotomy, that is we open the sphincter or do a we remove the whole of the spin, uh, sorry, fistulotomy or a fistulectomy. And especially if the disease is mild, as you told, so if that is the case, then we would like to completely cure it in a single go. And for the second disease, enteroentric fistula, for the second the question, enteroentric fistula only we intervene in specific conditions where the symptoms warrant. If the patient may have obstructive features, the patient may have bleeding and the third is the patient may have uh, enteroentric, they ha may have uh, associated enterocutaneous fistula which may cause significant symptom, only then we like to intervene or if there is bacterial overgrowth because of uh, enteroentric fistula or else usually we do not uh, try to intervene because most of these patients would require a stoma. And again, as I told you, the stoma reversal rate is very low in such patients. So that is the reason only if it's symptoms warrant, only then we uh, try to intervene. I think Sanjeev will have the one of the highest uh, experience on enteroenteric fistulas. We've had a series of patients, particularly young patients, and uh, they were partially responsive to biologics. The quality of life improved significantly. Of them, I think Sanjeev, there is one who is still with the stoma but still feels that she is um, much uh, better. But I think when we are pushed to the corner, we need the surgeon. Surgery, right, right, you are right ma'am. So, surgery should be the last resort 
but definitely surgery will improve the quality of life in such patients who are very crippled with symptoms definitely they have a very good quality of life isn't it amazing how the surgeons bail us out of difficult situations varghese mentioned in the unaffordable patient get the surgeon in early you say that in a, when you push to the corner get the surgeon in i think over and over again we've seen that uh, yeah yeah come us out of difficult situations I think in so private, in private, the surgeons are very expensive. <laughs> I I okay. agree, uh, Doctor okay. Desa. Okay. Your comments are always uh, 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 very Bitty. practical and witty and gritty. Yes, witty and gritty. I'm in cheek. Anyway, I think uh, we've had a good discussion. It's now close to uh, close to two hours, uh, but we do definitely have to provide that. That that slot and the space for a message from Kenya, uh, as we usually do for every each and every meeting of ours, IBD ENC, we dedicate one particular meeting to one area, one country uh, member of IBD ENC. Today it is the turn of Kenya, and it is over to Professor Ogutu and then Dr. Smitha for the message from Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this great faculty uh, to discuss IBD uh, masterclass, uh, which uh, IBD in the uh, masterclass on uh, being organized by Dr. Rupa and her. And I uh, sent a questionnaire to see to for uh, uh, sixteen. Uh, um, gastroenterologists in the country uh, from three cities Nairobi, Mombasa and uh, uh, Eldred and the, what I found is that in six months in the last six months the doctors the gastroenterologists had seen 52 cases of inflammatory bowel disease of which 50 were ulcerative confirmed cases of ulcerative colitis and two were cases of Crohn's disease. This was surprising to us because we thought that Crohn's is now non-existent in our country. But here, within six months, we are seeing two cases of Crohn's. And uh, the only thing we need to know that these two cases of Crohn's were found at surgery. They came with abdominal pain, features of obstruction, and when they opened up, histology came back, it was diagnosed as Crohn's. Uh, what we also need to note is that uh, uh, what we found is that uh, uh, the use of biologicals in our, among our gastroenterologists is quite low, and only fifteen percent of the uh, gastroenterology uh, only fifteen percent of the patients uh, were on of the gastroenterologists had put their patients on the on uh, biologicals. Uh, so this is uh, quite. Uh, no, maybe it was because majority of patients were mild to moderate, or possibly the expense of the biologicals hindered the use of the biologicals. Uh, however, the, the usual diagnostic uh, um, modalities are used. The only thing we also found is that very few doctors are using fecal cal protectin to follow their patients. So maybe this is an area which we could also improve on. Thank you, Rupa and the AIG team for asking me to talk on IBD in Kenya. Um, Nairobi is a cosmopolitan city and has large NGOs and government organizations. Our population IBD tends to reflect this. Of the 116 patients that I have on database right now, 80% um, constitute expatriates and the rest are Asians and Africans. However, it has been noted that our incidence seems to be increasing uh, 
quite a bit in all this time. Most of the patients we tend to see ulcerary colitis, uh, but um, we do see occasional uh, Crohn's disease as well. The possible etiological factors seems to be genetic factors, diet, our itri fast food eateries have grown exponentially uh, in Nairobi, uh, smoking, uh, hygiene, you know, most of the people who did grow up in villages where hygiene was probably not as closely observed uh, tend to be immune, but that is not to say it's not creeping up in villages as well. The and the gut microbiome. The causes of diarrhea are multifold. Uh, in in Kenya, we have to be aware that of amoebiasis, typhoid, cystosomiasis, strongyloides, HIV, and especially the ulcer forming diseases like the TB and the amoeba. The problems we do face are that we don't have that many advanced endoscopies because often a diagnosis of colitis is based on endoscopy. The equipment is expensive to buy and maintain and GI pathologists are hard to come by as well. The drugs are expensive, sulfasalazine is probably the most uh, of the one of the cheapest drugs available. However, SA compounds, uh, immunosuppressants and biologics are available but are of reach for most Kenyans. Uh, we do tend to import an as name basis as well. There are other psychosocial factors, namely the embarrassment, especially in some cultures of having a colonoscopy. Um, the the resistance is is there and we have to fight it uh, traditional medicine tends to have a role especially in villages and generally when you explain the side effects of the drugs the lot of patients do find it unacceptable to have so many side effects so to kind of sum up i would say that ibd is present in kenya among the blacks and as we have seen in six months a number of cases have been seen and the most striking thing is that the message we pass is Crohn's disease is coming up. We should be on the lookout for it. Patients with GI symptoms, or obstructive type of symptoms, we should be on the lookout and is present. And this could be because of the change in culture, westernization, diet change. And uh, so I think we are going to see more and more cases uh, in the near future. And we intend to conduct a study to cover the whole country among all the gastroenterologists, maybe look at the last one year or do a prospective, and maybe in a year's time we should give you the true picture of YBD in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that was quite informative, and uh, uh, we sort of got a glimpse of uh, uh, what's going on in Kenya as far as IBD is concerned. Thank you very much. And uh, it is over to uh, Dr. Jayanti for uh, closing remarks and then to Rupa. Thank you, Dr. D. Um, so on behalf of our course director, Dr. Rupa, and my co-moderator, Dr. Jayan Ramesh, we thank all the panelists for giving an excellent talk and uh, wide coverage on various aspects of visualizing Crohn's disease. And, uh, and to the Kenyan, uh, the country where we had a glimpse of the problem of IBD in their own country. And um, even this, this is exactly what we saw even I, when I was doing this study in UK that we had more of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's was almost uh, not seen at all amongst the Bangladeshis. But over a period of time, we find that, as Rupa had mentioned, the Crohn's is now taking up in most of these uh, developing countries in the third world. With these few concluding remarks, I would like to close the session. Thank you all. Rupal, you would like to say a few words? Excellent session. <laughs> Technical glitches made it more perfect. Uh, and I suppose we are all set for the next month. And I think next month is important because we are doing the IBDNC masterclass in celebration of the International Women's Day in March. Unaddressed women's issues in IBD. And I think all of you would like to join in because we are having stalwarts from across the globe who are going to address all these uh, various issues. 
No program is ever complete without thanking our sponsors and uh, I take this opportunity to thank Takeda Pharmaceuticals, Johnson & Johnson, Micro Labs and Dr. Reddy Labs for providing academic support and being a strong academic partner with IBD ENC. Thank you. Good night, so, Rupa, everybody. Rupa, and will there be will there be an additional master class on on address main issues? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who will be moderating the session? That will be in Men's International Day. If you have one. Yes. So Dr. Ramesh is also smiling. So I see. I can see Professor Ellie. Madhunil and <laughs> Professor Varghese, Dr. Vishal, yes, let us have one on men's issues as well. But right now, women have stole the limelight. And see you 25th March next Your month. Show. Your Thank show. You. <laughs> I will take what one leave. <laughs>